and sustainability at the Northern, Uni Northern Arizona University. That's right. <laughs> and uh, Abe is always trying to, to link ecology and uh, groundwater flow, regional and local groundwater flow. And that makes it really interesting because he used multidisciplinary approaches, works with different people from different sub disciplines in earth and environmental science. And that's why he is also this year the um, birth, bird sale dries lecture um, from the Geological Society of America, giving him the opportunity to travel one year around the world and um, yeah, for his outstanding contribution in hydro hydrogeology, bringing this nice lecture also now to Erwag. And um, I'm really happy to have you here. And um, thanks. And the floor is, is yours. All right, it's already on. Yeah. Put it on so I don't drop it. Laser pointed. Well, thank you, Christian. And uh, uh, really like to th uh, thank Eovag for your great generosity in, in hosting the lecture. Uh, my wife and I really enjoyed our first trip to uh, Switzerland. So it's, it's been a pleasure to come here and visit with you today. And those of you online, I'll save time for you guys, hopefully, for some questions and discussion today. Um, I, I want to, um, as Christian said, um, help geologists recognize the value that springs have for things beyond water supply <laughs> and how they're valuable for ecosystems, but for also cultural things. Uh, mostly, I'm going to show you a lot of pretty pictures of springs. Uh, for those of you who've been to many, well, outside of Switzerland, but most springs in the world are not very photogenic. You maybe have water discharge into a wetland and it's green and it's got mud and it's not a very fun place to visit, but I'll show you pictures like this. This is a, a spring from um, a Vasey's Paradise. It's a named spring in um, a Grand Canyon National Park. Uh, when it's high water level in the karst system, water discharges out of three different points and it, right now it's actually dry. Uh, reflecting our current climate. The spring cascades down a cliff through a, a monoculture of poison ivy. Uh, those poison ivy host an endemic terrestrial snail, the Kanab amber snail. So I just want to give you many examples of the uniqueness and diversity of life that springs host. Uh, it, as Christian said, the lecture series um, is sponsored by the Hydrogeology Scientific Division of the Geological Society of America. It's named in honor of, of John Birdsell, uh, formerly of the U.S. Geological Survey, and, and Shirley Dreiss, formerly of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Sadly, Shirley Dreiss uh, uh, had an untimely passing right after she was this lecture uh, in 1993, and her friends and family helped increase the endowment. Uh, the, the, out, the lecture series outside of North America, which brings me here, uh, is sponsored by uh, an endowment set up by the Lamoureux family. I'm sure, Mario, you've met Jim Lamoureux. Christian, I don't know if you've got to meet Jim yet, but the Lamoureux family has been a, a great supporter of hydrogeology internationally for a very long time. So Jim Lamoureux and his family set this up in honor of, of Phil and Bunny Lamoureux. Uh, just a little bit about uh, my lineage. Uh, scientifically, um, I studied under... Um, Scott uh, Bear at, uh, at Ohio State University. Um, Scott was this lecture in the year 2000, talked about the Woburn Mass. If you've ever read the book, A Civil Action, seen the not as good a movie with John Travolta, um, uh, Scott talked about the forensic geology of understanding that contaminated sites. Uh, Scott studied under Dick Perizak, who if you do any karst research, you know Dick's work. Uh, Dick is a faculty and still emeritus at Pennsylvania State University. And, and Dick studied, un, studied under uh, Burke Maxey. Um, uh, and uh, Burke did his PhD uh, at Princeton uh, back in the 50s. I just learned this at the ModFlow and More conference a couple weeks ago. And I want to be sure to thank a lot of colleagues um, uh, before I get going in the talk. Most notably, uh, my main colleagues, uh, Dr. Larry Stevens and Jerry Ledbetter at the Spring Stewardship Institute. I'll give you a lot of resources and information uh, to Springs ecosystems that are all available 
uh, through a website I'll show you many times, including a cloud-based uh, database, Springs Online, that hosts uh, interdisciplinary ecosystem level information about Springs. So I'll, I'll share these things with you through the talk. So again, Springs, uh, and, and be, as a hydrogeologist trying to promote why springs are important for the, the types of life, both natural, biological, and cultural human resources that they support. Many of the challenges behind uh, springs uh, is from knowing how to manage them. And that's from a lot of reasons, and I'll give you some examples specifically about differences and uh, disputes and concerns about having a common classification system uh, for springs. Many hydrogeologists in many regions are used to seeing springs only from their type of hydrogeological terrain and they develop very generalized specific classifications just for karst or just for hanging gardens or something. But what hydrogeologists have not brought to the ec ecologists is this consistent worldview uh, and, and description and or a database, those things can really help people from different disciplines talk to each other and, and help promote uh, their improvement of stewardship. Um, one thing our colleague uh, Marco Contenati, a good aquatic ecologist, has helped promote through this paper is the, the intersection between uh, groundwater and ecology is this region of space we've try to coin a term for is eco hydrogeology. Um, and at this space, there are specific forms of life that occur where groundwater emerges. They may be called crenobionts, creno being Latin uh, for spring, but it's that intersection. Ja, Danke schön und dir. Ich komme gerade aus den Ferien und äh, ja, bin jetzt wieder voll im Einsatz und am Ausschaffen. Ja. <lacht> Wie kann ich dir helfen? Could you switch off the, the microphone? Okay. Is the slides advancing? Are they okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> to be honest, I, I don't know how it Ich guck mal kurz, was ich da jetzt gerade schon sehe. Um, es kann sein, die Tina aus dem Labor war vorhin bei mir, aber da war ich beschäftigt, hat mich gefragt, wie sie was bewerten soll. Ich wusste jetzt nicht, Hey, du bist mitten im Talk, kannst du mal ruhig sein, oder was? <lacht> Schalt mal dein Mikro aus, wir hören hier gerade einen Talk, ne? danke. No, it should be fine. Are we okay now? <lacht> I didn't get all of that. I got part of that, but <laughs> um, there's also great debate and, and question about exactly what is a spring. And we could even talk, what is groundwater? Many people want to, I found, apply a term of residence time to groundwater. So if something infiltrates today and comes out tomorrow, is it groundwater? If it goes a meter in the subsurface, is it groundwater? Uh, and I think a, a lot of uh, people's conceptions of that is based on their scientifically, their discipline, but in hydrogeology, it's a lot based on their worldview on how they conceptualize aquifers and groundwater flow systems. So different people conceptualize them differently. Uh, my colleague Larry and I have tried to promote a very simple di distinction of a spring is simply any place where groundwater discharges at or near the Earth's surface. Um, and many people would disagree with that, uh, but we think that's a good place to start discussion. And what's unique about springs, and the reason why that's important, where the groundwater emergence uh, is highlighted here with this book on the right. This is one of the first comprehensive books on springs as ecosystems. It came out of a, a symposium held by the, uh, the desert, Sonoran Desert uh, Museum about 15 years ago. The specific spring is a place uh, that's shown here, Montezuma Well. It's not named for Montezuma and it's not a well, but it's a collapsed travertine spring mound that discharges really high amounts of carbon dioxide and arsenic. The CO2 levels are so high that fish can't live in this aquatic system. What does live in the system are these amphipods that are endemic 
This is a specific species that only occurs at this one spring on the landscape. And the poor amphipods by nighttime are chased by leeches and by daytime are chased by water scorpions and giant water bugs. All of those species are endemic, meaning they are specialists and their species only occur and live at this one point on earth. This spring also at, at, at the um, emergence of the spring that overflows out of the travertine spring pool is a tiny spring snail, a pergolopsis, which is also endemic uh, to this spring. There's about 150 endemic spring snails to the Great Basin physiographic province of Western North America. Springs are important for humans. Uh, many of the, as you guys know from this region uh, and from the Balkans, from Italy, uh, from Austria, much of the water supply tr has come from springs for a very long period of time. There's a long history of cultural evolution at sites. Some authors have uh, determined that the presence of springs in some landscapes contributed to human evolution by having that permanent and continuous source of water. Why else are springs important? We've had the opportunity to do comprehensive inventories on springs across large landscapes. The landscape I'll share the most we know about is the Greater Grand Canyon ecoregion. It is the region that physically drains through Grand Canyon National Park. I'll revisit the park for those of you who aren't familiar with it later and tell you more about it. But almost one half of the plant species or about a thousand plant species occur at only the springs. Grand Canyon's an arid to semi-arid landscape and the springs are a very small piece of that overall landscape, but they really densely pack in a, a lot of diversity of life. Springs serve as oases. Uh, through many types of conditions, temperature fluctuations. Uh, many of you may know the story of a large swimming mammal in Florida called the manatee, that in the winter when the ocean is cold, the manatee all swim into the coastline and stay at the springs, which are warmer. So there's many types of species that depend on one or more of their life stages for springs. I'll give you other examples through the talk today. Humans have significantly impacted them. We don't always understand those impacts and what they have on the, on the systems. Also, um, I'll give you some examples of this, this bullet point. Um, there's a common perception of hydrogeologists that professional hydrogeologists use wells and boreholes where amateurs use springs. <laughs> and I hope to dissuade you of that perception that some professionals have that a spring, you can analyze many important things about the flow in chemistry to determine the properties of the aquifer. That's not commonly accepted a lot of places. I'll end the talk by giving you some examples of the economic values of springs and implications for law and management of them. Again, springs support a lot of different types of important species. Generally, if you take your aquatic ecologist or botanist friends out with you to a spring, they're probably going to find something that's not very common, that may be rare, or it's the most. It's the highest most, the lowest most, the northernmost or the southernmost distribution of a certain species because of the permanence in water, temperature, or chemistry of that spring on the landscape. So they usually extend the range of many species when you look. We've gone to springs way up in northern Alberta and Canada and found species that are normally distributed in Nebraska in the central plains of the US. How do springs function as ecosystems? This is our best guess at a conceptual ecosystem model for springs. Uh, springs have some state variables uh, which govern them, the climate, the geology, the aquifer interactions. Those external physical driving variables influence the type of geomorphology and microclimate you get at a site. So you get different types of aspect, elevation, uh, and, and geomorphology, different types of landscape features. Those influence the type of disturbance, the, the productivity of the sites, which then drive the biogeography, the soils, and the ecosystem goods and services you get at a site. 
eventually those all affect the assemblage compositions and the population dynamics. I'll give you some specific examples of a couple different landscapes where changes in this um, assemblage composition dramatically impacts the types of ecosystems we have on springs. To get at the, um, the lexicon, the, the description for classification of springs, Larry and I went to the literature. Uh, Oscar Meinzer of the US Geological Survey published a document in 1923 called The Waters of the US. In there, Oscar proposed uh, three spheres of discharge, three geomorphologies of occurrence of groundwater on our surface. After that publication, hydrogeologists largely ignored <laughs> springs. Through the 50s, Heinz and other aquatic ecologists picked up this uh, classification of springs and de described other spheres of discharge. All Larry and I did was accumulate what people had done in the literature and try to make it more concise. We put this paper out, which has some schematics of various spheres of discharge. Uh, we've so far recommended 13 spheres of discharge. The one I don't have a schematic for is one of the most common on Earth, which is anthropogenic. It's a spring whose geomorphology is 100% developed by humans now. Uh, so humans are very important agents of geomorphic change. Outside of that, the spheres of discharge, which are most common, are those which discharge directly into stream channels, rheocrines, those which discharge into low gradient uh, areas, uh, uh, helicrines, uh, sienegas, soap poles, other features like that. And then hill slopes are, are common where you have uh, topographic uh, relief on, on places. These figures are helpful, but they're not alone diagnostic for classifying springs. Larry led this publication that came out last year, and I'm happy you know, if you guys can't find it easily, but it's in ecological applications. Um, it's a dichotomous key to classify the sphere of discharge based on a series of yes and no questions for descripting, describing sites. Um, we've gotten a lot of tremendous feedback on this proposed key. We'd encourage you all to uh, look at your landscapes and the springs you look at wherever you work and to give us suggestions on spheres of discharge or things that may be approved. We've already accumulated some very good feedback uh, on this and we'd appreciate some more. Once you have a sense of um, classifying the, the sphere of discharge of his spring, uh, what's important is to have a consistent set of interdisciplinary data that can be shared and integrated with other springs inventory data. At a minimum, we've recommended that these types of information should be collected for springs ecosystems. Generally, that type of information requires a couple hour visit to a site with experts in geology, geomorphology, or geochemistry, an expert in aquatic ecology, an expert in botany, and then preferably an expert uh, in cultural history, somebody who knows the, the history of the spring, its place on the landscape and how humans have interacted with it, or the manager of a spring, the, the farmer, the city, the canton, whoever manages the site. From there, collect information uh, about flow, chemistry, plant list, species cover, uh, aquatic invertebrates to the lowest level of taxonomic delineation that you can. And then once you've done that, um, well, geologists knew our fun part's always measuring discharge. Um, many of the springs in the Southwest and Western North America we work with, you just need a little container and a stopwatch because they generally are milliliters per minute to maybe a liter per second of flow. But uh, other techniques are certainly helpful depending on the size and shape of the channel or outflow. In the ecosystem models for springs, productivity is generally driven by the amount of incoming solar radiation. Many springs occur on the landscapes on topography that has uh, limitations to the amount of incoming sunlight that can occur where the spring discharges. 
This is an example of a little device, this little tripod here, I've set on it, this little device here called a solar pathfinder. What it does, it has a dome that reflects the horizon onto a template for a specific latitude that gives you sunrise and sunset for every month of the year. From the sunrises and sunsets, you can calculate the kilojoules per year of incoming solar radiation and get a quick estimate of the solar radiation budget. The picture I'm showing you here, this little blue patch on here is where this spring gets sunlight. It never ever gets it to the right of this blue patch, never gets any afternoon sun through the whole year. In the spring and summer, it gets late morning sun and it never gets any sun in the winter. So knowing that distribution of the solar radiation is, and this is a, about a 300 uh, franc instrument. It's very cheap and effective. Uh, so it's, it's a great tool to have. It's generally used by a construction people looking for the uh, solar radiation for solar panels on roofs, <laughs> uh, but it's easily adaptable uh, for other uses. All this information is most valuable when it's uh, in a consistent format that's shared uh, with other colleagues. Uh, Jerry Ledbetter at the Spring Stewardship Institute's developed this amazing online uh, web source, uh, cloud source database called springsdata.org. Uh, there's over 1,200 global users of this database and over 150,000 global entries with Springs. There's very few governmental agencies in the world, in fact, I'm not sure I know of any, that support and maintain a database that collects all this information. We have different databases in many different federal international places that may have small pieces of this data, but not all together. The database is linked consistently with these interdisciplinary data and how people in those professions would do it. For the plant list, there's a drop down list of the uh, Latin name of all the plants. You cannot type in the word tree. <laughs> you have to enter uh, Salix or Populus in the species name. So you can't type in the same for invertebrates or vertebrates. You have to select from a drop down list the appropriate name of, of the animal. The chemistry is linked to consistent, uh, in this case, it's the US Environmental Protection Agency, uh, consistent database uh, and other databases. Every user of the database can set their own levels of permission uh, to the data. For example, if you are a data manager for Springs, you're fine with letting the public know where they are, but you don't want the public to know what types of animals occur at a spring you can block the access to the animal database from that, but you could still allow that to be done. In, in these states, um, our forest management service, the Federal Forest Management Service has adopted this database, uh, as has our, many of our other public lands, actually all the federal public land agencies have adopted this database. This is a snapshot of springs in, in Western US from, from a recent night uh, update of the geo database. Many of the uh, indigenous tribes in, in North America have adopted the database and many individual states uh, within the US have adopted this. The US Geological Survey has not adopted this and they still do not, we still do not have a federal springs database supported by the US federal government. Once you have these type of large data sets, as many of you know who work with large data, you can start to do very impressive meta-analyses on data sets. So far, uh, Larry has done a quick analysis of the database to date, and he's demonstrated there are at least 1,200 species in the database that require a spring for at least one of their life stages uh, to live. What Larry's coined the term as a springs uh, dependent species. Springs are also important because they're the source of most of the rivers of the world. Most people know that, but hydrogeologists are generally not very good at conveying that information to the public or to water managers or to other people. How many springs are on earth? 
There's no good data for that. This is a best guess from a lot of colleagues uh, who thought about this. Where are springs on landscapes? Uh, does Switzerland have a map of the springs of the country? <laughs> where would you know where to start? That's a good, I'll show you an example here in a moment. But springs supply most rivers of the world. The example I use in my region is the Colorado River. Most people in the US think the Colorado River starts its flow at a glacier that melts above the Coors Beer Brewery in Colorado. <laughs> and that's not the case. The Colorado River, which does headwater in the mountains of Colorado and Wyoming, still gets the majority of its flow from groundwater flow. We've recently documented with instrumented record in the Grand Canyon reach of the Colorado River, and even in this very arid climate in the middle of the desert, in that reach of the river in Northern Arizona and adjoining Southern Utah, about 5% of the river's flow comes from the springs and groundwater uh, in the region. Groundwater discharge is very important for the surface water supplies and many surface water managers do not understand and recognize uh, the sources of the water that they get in their surface water, especially in snow dominated terrains. There's a really overestimation in the importance of snow in many snow dominated terrains. Many, some it is, but in many of those snow dominated terrains is still the groundwater that's important. Just to give you a few snapshots from the US, varying states have good information based on their specific region. If you've been to Florida, you may have seen some of their large pool forming uh, springs. That's mostly what Florida knows about. Uh, if you go to um, Texas, they mostly know the big springs that come out of the caves in the center of the state and other places. So different states have focused their attention to different. Remarkably, the state in the US uh, outside of Arizona, I'll show you in a moment, is in the upper Midwest in Wisconsin. They had historic inventories of springs a century ago by their state's geologic and natural history survey that they've largely repeated over the last 10 years. So they've documented very good changes in the systems through time. In Arizona, we're an arid state where I live. Um, we generally get, uh, uh, the wettest place in the state gets 400 millimeters of precipitation a year. Everything else is significantly lower than that. Um, and we do know we have over 12,000 springs there, but of those, only about a thousand of them have a complete inventory of all the plants and animals and chemistry and factors at them. So there's a lot we still don't know about them. How do we learn information like this about where springs are in landscapes? It's challenging in different places. We did a study to try to better understand how springs are distributed across the landscape using a theory called an accumulation curve. You've probably seen or heard of this from other disciplines or studies. The theory is um, the more frequently you sample a population, the more samples you collect, the greater through time your, your number of samples is going to approach the population. So if you go to the rainforest, one visit, you get 100 insects. You come back, you get 50 more. You come back, you get 20 more. Eventually, you should approach the number of insects that are in the Amazon rainforest. The theory we applied was to a region um, in the Great Basin of Western US, a place called Death Valley. Death Valley uh, has areas uh, below sea level, over uh, 50 meters below sea level parts of it. It's one of the driest places uh, in North America but it has mountains which go over 3,000 meters uh, in elevation. There were four, his it, it, so this is one of the places in the US where water is most precious and important. If you would assume any landscape where everybody knew every source of water is, you would assume this would be the landscape. There have been four different surveys of the springs done over the last century in that region. If you look at the density of springs from each of those four different survey dates, that curve still hasn't approached an asymptote. So even in the most arid climate, I, we could pick, it still appears as if there are springs left on that landscape that haven't been identified, mapped, and described. So I won't disappoint anymore. Let's look at some pretty pictures of the Grand Canyon. Uh, if you haven't been there yet, please come out and visit me sometime. Uh, best way to do it's on a river float trip. Um, but um, 
the Grand Canyon, which many people don't recognize, is a cave and karst park. It's more than that giant ditch in the earth, uh, that giant canyon. The entire surface of so this uh, green area here is the Grand Canyon region, but to the north and south of it, the plateaus are all limestone. It's a karst unit at the surface, and then there's a deeper karst unit down over a thousand meters. There are over 6,000 dolines on the region to the north of the Grand Canyon, a place called the Kaibab Plateau. It is an internally drained karst terrain that's over uh, 3,000 meters high. Um, within the canyon, there are over 300 caves. There are more caves in this park than any other park in the, U in the United States. Many of you may have heard of Mammoth Caves National Park as, as the scenic cave and karst park, but Grand Canyon is really a cave and karst park. Just all the caves are really remote and difficult to access. From this region, we lack data that many of you are used to having. There are zero wells down to these aquifers in this region. There's never been oil and gas development, so there's no geophysical data <laughs> across the region. The only place we can study and understand the aquifers are where they daylight, where the canyons expose the rocks and, and the springs occur. This is a, a cross section from the north uh, rim over, uh, it goes up higher than I'm showing you here, through the Grand Canyon. This is a plateau, the southern edge of the Colorado Plateau. And then this is the edge of the Colorado Plateau drops down into the adjoining uh, a transition zone physiographic project province of North America. There's two different karst units. There's this shallow karst unit, this upper blue unit, and then there's this deeper karst unit that's down over a thousand meters. This upper unit has some shallow perched uh, groundwater places in it, but the regional water table is way down here, over a thousand meters across most of the landscape. The aquifer is never exposed until it's truncated uh, by the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon or by the adjoining river off the edge of the Colorado Plateau. It's easier for us to study the behavior of springs to understand the aquifer properties than to spend a few million dollars to drill wells down <laughs> in that aquifer. The region, as I mentioned, uh, is semi-arid. It's around 400 millimeters of precipitation a year. Precipitation is bimodally distributed. It's actually snow driven. At those high elevations, 60% uh, of the annual precipitation falls as snow. The rest falls in a, in a winter, I mean, in a summer rainy season, which is right now. Uh, we call it the monsoon season. Um, and less than 2% of all precipitation generally recharges in this region. But that recharge, is very focused to the karst features, the dolines, and the dissolution enhanced faults and fractures, and is very ephemeral. It usually only occurs for a few days to a few weeks around snowmelt season every two to three years. So recharge does not happen year round. It's very short lived and it's very focused in its places. Most of that water discharges, and this is one of the uh, most dramatic springs on earth I'm showing you here. This is a spring called Thunder River. Uh, it discharges out of a cave, out of the cliff of the, um, the Redwall limestone. And because it's difficult to give you, uh, to understand scale from a picture like this, each of these little green blobs here uh, is a 20 meter tall tree. Um, so those are populous trees and waters cascading over a thousand meters uh, down this cliff uh, from that spring. This spring supports every type of geomorphic substrate and surface you could imagine that could occur on the surface of the earth, short of being frozen. <laughs> um, so it supports an extraordinary diversity of life. This water comes out of the cave and then cascades down a cliff uh, to the nearby stream. If we look at the south rim, the area south of the canyon, this gives you sense, this is that upper karst unit, and it's a thousand meters down to the base of this lower limestone unit. Uh, 
On the south rim, the springs are different. They generally are small. They're not connected to caves, but they support these uh, reaches of uh, uh, phreatophytic vegetation, normally salix and populus species and some sedges and rushes. This is a spring that we've had uh, 30 years of continuous measurement data on it until in October of 2019, a backcountry hiker uh, staying at this site set their toilet paper on fire and created a catastrophic wildfire that led to almost full mortality of most of the populace uh, trees uh, in this area. Last summer, uh, in our summer rainy season, we had an 86 millimeter rainfall event in under three hours on this catchment uh, that proceeded to create uh, a significant runoff event that took this system and incised it some places up to two meters deep and mobilized some boulders up to two meters in diameter. So to give you an sense of the sense of the extremes uh, in disturbance <laughs> regimes from these types of experience can exhibit both from a human cause and from nature cause. We estimate this, this flood last year was a um, 500 year recurrence of interval. So a not very common type of event. At this spring system through time, we have a pretty good instrumented record now. And over the 30 years we've instrumented until the fire burned all the instruments and melted them, there was a continuous decline in stream flow. And at the gauging site, there was a significantly increasing number of days of the year where the gauging site was dry. Over half of the year, there was enough vegetation in the stream channel and diminishment of groundwater flow that the stream gauge did not flow over half of the year. Recently, I had a student just finished this spring where we ran a groundwater flow model to better understand the reasons for the diminishment of spring flow at this site. There are some pumping wells on the south rim. They have a very minimal impact to the overall water budget. All of the change we've seen so far is due to our recent climate being exceptionally dry period of time and diminishing the recharge. Of the springs in that region, this, this is a, a, a box and whisper plot, and this is logarithmic in liters per second. Don't laugh at this. Um, I'm sure these springs all look insignificant <laughs> compared to most of the ones in Switzerland. But if you're on a five-day backpack trip in the Grand Canyon, you're counting on water at one of these springs to survive and make it through there. So this uh, just a month ago, I was at... Uh, uh, this lone tree spring, and uh, it had just enough that we could filter a few liters and get out the next day. All the readings of these springs we've had over the last year are below the fifth percentile in discharge. So we know not just from that one spring, but all the springs in this region, they're experiencing some very dry climate conditions. The hydrogeology is a little different on the north side of the canyon because it's higher elevation and wetter. Um, and it has this karst plane of 6,000 sinkholes, which capture all the water. Some of it flows laterally through the shallow karst unit. Some of it drops down through faults and fractures and supports this deeper, well, you guys should ship some of this home. It's a, got a storm coming, um, to this deeper karst aquifer. And the shallow karst aquifer, this is the, um, the biggest spring, and you'll see it's ephemeral. Uh, it doesn't flow year round. I was just there three weeks ago. What's impacted this spring more than the climate are these critters. Uh, these are bison, uh, buffalo. This bison herd is not native to this region. There was an adjoining grassland uh, about 50 kilometers away that had a small herd of bison that 15 years ago decided to go for a wander and went up on the Kaibab Plateau, they quickly realized they could wander into the national park and not be shot. Um, so they've stayed there and they went from a herd of 30 to over 500 in 10 years. And the impacts of those bison on this landscape are devastating. Uh, this spring, and I, didn't, I should update this with last week, is 
solid mud wallow. There's zero vegetation. And this is in one of our most protected landscapes in the US is in a national park. What's missing from this ecosystem are natural predators. The wolves and the bears uh, were removed from this landscape over a century ago. The only uh, way to control this, uh, these bison now is by humans. In the US, this is a real challenge though. The, um, our National Park Service's emblem is the bison. The public assumes any national park they go to in the US to find a bison. You know, the National Mall in Washington, the Appomattox Ball Field, you know, Mount Vernon, George Washington's in the state, they just assume bison are at every national park. So the public love these things here, but they're just wreaking havoc and the park's really challenged by managing them. The region internally drains. This is some of these sinkholes in snowmelt season. The flow through the karst system is unexpected as, you, uh, as many might in, uh, theorize for this deep region. Um, this is one of my former students, uh, Graham Schindel, Gary's, Gary Schindel's son, if you guys have ever met Gary, great karst hydrologist. Um, this is a cave uh, that has the, the park's water supply. Grand Canyon National Park relies 100% on this spring for the source of water for the park. There's a pipeline that's over 20 miles long that goes all the way across the canyon and up to the south rim to supply the park's water supply. And then right here, there's a pumping lift station that lifts it up to the north rim. There, the park never had any measurements or instruments on it, but a decade ago, uh, Graham put uh, 800 meters inside this cave, uh, this gauging station here. We now have some really good continuous discharge measurements from the spring to interpret the aquifer and help the park manage their water supply. One thing that was surprising to everybody was the rapid response of the system. For those who study car systems, this is no surprise. It had not been documented here. With a strong summer rainstorm, which are rare, or a big summer or big winter snowmelt season, it only takes two to three days for water to melt, go through those sinkholes, go down a thousand meter and tens of kilometers laterally and come out the spring. So even this really deep remote system, like most car system has a very fast flow regime and a very slow flow regime. It's that slow flow regime that supplies the base flow year round, but you get these big peaks and discharge around individual uh, snow melt events. This landscape, because it's arid and semi as I was telling you earlier, Christian, some years we get no <laughs> recharge. <laughs> uh, there's no snow melt in some years. In some years, uh, sad, this was actually an average winter over the last 30 years of climate data, but it gave us a pretty good recharge year. That is partially helpful uh, for car systems. Another thing that's very helpful for car systems is not just to know that information, but which sinkholes connect to which springs. A common way to do that is through introducing dyes. Dye tracer studies, for those of you who've done, know they're challenging. In this region, uh, you have to fly a helicopter up to this region in the middle of the winter, ride a snowmobile out to where you think a sinkhole is, dig a pit, drop the dye in there, hope that there's enough snow to melt in the snow melt season that mobilizes that dye and moves it through the system. For these dye studies, uh, they're very labor intensive. It required over 300 kilometers of backpacking to deploy passive charcoal uh, dye collectors through over 40 springs throughout this reach of the Grand Canyon where we anticipated we might recover the dye. Dyes were introduced on major faults that were theorized to contribute to the water supply spring right here. The first four dyes that were introduced went everywhere but that spring, almost every other spring in the park. The last dye that was done uh, did flow there, but we've been unable to find the, the resources. And quite honestly, we haven't had the climate to mobilize uh, the dyes lately. Another important thing for hydrogeologists generally contribute for karst terrains is to their knowledge of the karst to describe the vulnerability aquifer. This is a vulnerability model 
uh, Natalie Jones made for the Kaibab Plateau. So the, the hotter areas here are those where there are faults and fractures and high density of conduits that um, can enhance mobility of things that can it, it reduce the aquifer's quality. The park is using this information to guide resource management. There's a road that goes right through here. So to try to minimize the impacts of potential highway accidents might have to introduce things into the aquifer. To finish up the Grand Canyon, as I started off with, there are over 300 known caves. Um, the fifth longest cave in our national park system is currently mapped at over 65 kilometers. And quite honestly, they're just getting started. Um, and there's a, over 100 kilometers of map passageway in the canyon. They, the caves are very helpful, not fun for speleologists and for understanding the hydrogeology, uh, but they've also maintained, like many caves, important uh, paleontological and cultural features uh, in them. They're a great record of the Pleistocene climate from these caves. This cave double bopper, um, and, and just to again reinforce how challenging this work is, uh, requires a two-day backpack trip to a 100-foot free rappel into a cave, and then you get to the cave and access it for a week or more to get to the unmapped portion of it to start doing new exploration and work. Uh, and th these, just for example, there are 28 species of bats in Grand Canyon National Park alone. That wasn't known until about three years ago. Just a tremendous amount of knowledge and information out there. One of the theories Larry and I have been trying to demonstrate with springs is an assumption that individual spheres of discharge have a certain association of plants and animals with them. Just as you're familiar with uh, a tundra environment has a certain association of plants, and a certain type of forest has a certain type of plants and animals associated. Our assumption has been uh, a rheocrine sphere of discharge spring has a certain type of plants and animals associated with it. In the greater Grand Canyon ecoregion where we've had the best data so far, we're now able to predict half of the plant species we would expect at four spheres of discharge. We think there's good promise in that hypothesis and assumption, but we encourage colleagues all around the world to do this exercise for their landscapes. That's really helpful for managers to predict what types of plants, or if you're doing restoration work of a spring, you want to reestablish the geomorphology or plant species, what type should be there. I'll show you an example quickly of one of this where we've done a lot of restoration work. Uh, it's a site not in the Grand Canyon, but adjacent to it on the edge of the Colorado Plateau. It's a region that's largely the vegetation type's been stable since the end of the ice ages, as has erosion. But over the last century, by excluding fire in these landscapes and bringing in cattle and grazing them over a century and a half ago, led to significant incision of a lot of wet meadows and alluvial systems. Uh, at this site that's fed by a spring, we tried to stabilize the channel by doing earth moving, putting in cross vein weirs and other sta channel stabilization features. That was also the restoration work was informed by some of our hydrogeology and geochemistry. We were able to take a long-term record of isotope data to predict when the system gets moisture from which season, summer, winter, um, and apply that to other springs in the region. Isotopes in Arizona are very diagnostic for giving you the season and elevation of precipitation, which is very helpful for delineating the sources of water in the catchments. Again, I don't have wells in these systems, so I need to use the, the water chemistry to do that. Like all tools and techniques we knew, we, we always try to find things that are cheaper and more effective and efficient. My laboratory can analyze O18 deuterium for $6.75. Uh, that's something I can afford to collect. I, I actually in my pack have four formulas here with me today if you wanna give me one. Um, but other things that springs can reveal to us, this is our, our discharge record for that spring clover. Just by simply doing a decomposition of the hydrograph, we can interpret the, con the type of aquifer it is. It's an ephemeral spring. It only gets water from conduits and fractures. It has no matrix permeability. 
the system wets quickly from a rainfall or snowball event and dries quickly. The length of time it flows is not dependent on how much snow we get, it's dependent on how late in the year the snow melts. So it doesn't matter if we get a meter of snow in December, what's more important is if we get some snow that's still on the ground in March. So it's that length of year that provides the greater amount of flow. How those things can be used in management, we partnered with our, our land, federal land management agencies and a separate thing I haven't really described at all yet is a condition criteria. There's a, a, if you look on the website, there's an assessment protocol we've recommended to assess the condition and risk of sites from human activities. This is one where we assess springs across a couple of landscapes and this red box is an area where we recommended to the land manager springs that were the highest priority for management. The other springs over here were springs that were so beat up, it would be difficult for that manager to find enough time and money to improve their condition. Another landscape where we compare this to, this is from Southern Alberta, uh, Canada. This region has no springs in this field. All the springs are in pretty good condition. What's different in Southern Canada over Northern Arizona is this. There are grizzly bear and wolves on that landscape. The presence of all that assembly uh, species composition improves the trophic dynamics and really lessens the impact to the springs uh, by having those critters on the landscape. A couple more things about human cultural use and stewardship. What is a spring worth? It's generally hard to come up with the value for a natural resource based on market forces. Economists have developed a whole separate set of economics called natural resource economics, where you generally use willingness to pay surveys. Instead of finding what the market uh, reveals, you see what people state through asking them questions in a survey. We did this type of instrument for Springs and Grand Canyon and found that every citizen in the US is willing to pay an annual fee on their taxes to conserve springs in Grand Canyon. The number is kind of in, unimportant, just that they're willing to do that. And they recognize the value that they have, even if they've never visited them and think they never will. The final challenge I'll leave you with with springs uh, is uh, who owns them? Uh, it varies everywhere. In the US, there is no national groundwater law. It's left to individual states. Individual states adopt their own groundwater laws that originally derive from the English rule where groundwater is, is, is private property. It's it literally interpreted in some places as the law of the biggest pump, such as Texas. If you own land, you own property, you can drill a well and pump as much as you want, irregardless of the impacts it has to anybody else. There's reasonable use doctrine, which applies in many other places. But the example I'm using here for species protection and stewardship of springs is an example from federal land. In 1952, it was recognized this, uh, this doline uh, near Death Valley National Park had an endemic fish in it, the devil's hole pupfish. That's the only point in the world where that fish exists. In 1960s, uh, some major corporation moved in and started drilling large capacity wells and irrigating the desert adjacent to this and the water levels started to drop in here, uh, impacting the ability for this fish to spawn and live. Because the federal government had incorporated this into the adjoining national park, the federal government was able to prove in our court system that there, the federal government had a reserved water right to the water in that hole and that that pumper was taking that water from the federal government. The federal government shut them down and they no longer pumped that. That's a really rare case in the US for the federal government to assert their federal water reserve right. What, it, what really the best form of protection is, is something that happened after that is the Endangered Species Act. The Endangered Species Act says it's against the law to take, threaten, harm, endanger 
an endangered plant or animal. This would have been considered a take of the habitat under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so that, that's our highest level protection. So it, it's hard for some hydrogeologists to recognize and understand, especially when I teach students in the US, a lot of the work they're doing is for the Endangered Species Act because they're trying to understand the groundwater dynamics that support or maintain a specific type of species. So just to summarize this, this is from a paper Marco Continati led uh, last year. Springs can all value for more education, better mapping, information management, um, improved classification. I'll give you some examples of moving towards that. Better discussion of policy, uh, improved inventory techniques. These are all things that are really important for this global protection and management of springs. Springs are everywhere on earth. Uh, many, most are still not known. Uh, Humans have lived and worked around them forever and will continue to. Um, they're important keystone ecosystems. I gave you some specific examples of that. They generally occupy a very small por proportion of most landscapes, but they support a much larger amount of plants and animals uh, than, than they should. There's also this correlation between geomorphic diversity and species diversity. The more, geomorph the more diverse geomorphically a spring occurrence is, the more diversity the plants are and animals. A wetland, a low gradient wet area, generally only has 10 to 12 plant species. Thunder River I showed you earlier probably has over 80 to 90 plant species at it. So that greater diversity in geomorphology generally leads to greater diversity in life. Humans have impacted springs everywhere uh, for many reasons. They generally lack protection from groundwater laws. Most of them are outside of protected lands. Uh, many of them are ecologically impaired, but the hope is, and that's part of my, my, my pitch on this tour, is that if we can all provide better inventory data, better assessment, we can provide better information to land and resource managers to hopefully improve springs ecosystems. So thank you, yeah. Let's see if I left any time for questions, Christian. Yeah, we still have. Seconds.